what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about this Judicial Council decision. <clears throat> the United Methodist Church has an executive branch, and it's called the Council of Bishops. And bishops are elected by jurisdictions or central conferences. Keep in mind, when you think about the United Methodist Church, we are global. We're global. And what that means is we, we include a lot of folks on the continent of Africa. That's our fastest growing part of the church. Multiple languages, you know. Um, you've got in, in any country in Africa, you typically have one to two tribal languages that are indigenous. But then you also have like Cote d'Ivoire and the Ivory Coast. There are a lot of United Methodists there. There's French speaking. You know, and you've got, uh, then you go on over to the Philippines, so you're in part of Asia there. We've got a big presence in the Philippines. And then you come to the United States, and of course, we're all over the U.S., we're in every state. We're, uh, more of us are on the East Coast in the center of the country than on the West Coast by a pretty good number. Part of that's because we stopped building new churches in the 1940s, and so the West Coast didn't get as many churches established. And it's unfortunate that we did that, um, that's when we lost a lot of our original zeal um, that some of us would like to see return. So you've got multiple cultures, and remember in Africa, in about half the countries in Africa right now, if you are caught in a homosexual act, that is criminalized. So when you come to the table internationally and you talk about LGBTQ inclusion, the African delegates will tell you that one of the issues they struggle with in their country is there are people in their churches who say, well, we don't have that here, that doesn't exist. So the conversation doesn't start with inclusion, it starts with acknowledgement. And I'll just tell you, somebody that grew up in Virginia, I find that just sort of stunning, right? But we, we, we also don't want to be colonial about how we do church. So lots of folks in Africa have experienced colonialization where white people came in and said, this is what you'll do and this is what you'll believe. And so our church has really worked very hard to acknowledge the cultural context, but also to, to guard that, to try to have an international inclusive denomination. But at the same time, in the United States, there are certain issues that just culturally have a different context than they do in other parts of the globe. And most of us are, um, you know, most of the people I hang out with are in the United States. And so, how do we, how do you do an international church? Like it's, it's virtually with 8 million, 11 million people. That's really, you, so are you starting to get the complexity of what I'm talking about? It's in that environment that we're talking about these topics. So, I created this thing that some of you have seen before, this little presentation that People are starting to use the United Methodist Church in different places. I get calls every so often. People are like, can you give me a copy of the sugar packet presentation? <laughs> and I'm not sure why it's, it's caught on. I think it, in part of it, I think it's because it's so quirky, because um, it's so low tech. I did this on the floor of my office with Jonathan and Pam Borland, and we were just drew it up. So when Americans, when North Americans begin to talk about this in the United Methodist Church, the, the topic, the, this, this is relevant only to this one topic, LGBTQ inclusion, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered persons. There are other acronyms that are being added to that, um, but I'm, I'm going to sort of simplify that um, for tonight. And it's not simple. I, I want to be the first to say that. We have gay people in our church. We have transgendered persons in our church. We have... Um, We've got everybody, we've got everybody in the acronyms in our church already, and we also have people whose children are um, dealing with this in real time. And so, you know, we, it's really important. And as I said this morning and this evening, it's important, not because it's an, just an important topic, it's important because these are real people. So I think we, we just have to figure this out for all of us. So, in America, there's just wide variance on this topic. Now, remember, I'm just talking about one, that one topic, okay, when I'm using these categories. So, I want you to think about these four categories. On the right, I want you to think about people that are traditionalist on this. So, a way to think about that is traditionalists are people who are like, I can't believe that the United States now, elects, now allows same-sex couples to, to be legally married. I'm just, I'm a traditionalist. That's surprising. Now, go to the other end. And you'll find on the left hand the 
progressive non-compatibilists. Progressives, I'm going to get to those second terms in a second. Progressives would say, of course, we should have been doing that 20 years earlier, right? I mean, what's, of course, that's what you would do. Now, all those people are in the United Methodist Church. Some of them are traditionalists who are non-compatibilist. And what that means is, if the church ever starts letting a pastor do a same-sex marriage, they're out. They are not compatible with that. Now, in our church, there's a group called the Wesley Covenant Association that's been working very hard, and they're, they're very organized, and they have a lot of money. And what they have done for many years is, is work to create a group of people, churches, identified churches and pastors that are traditionalists because they really want to hold the church in that space and have the book of discipline, which I forgot to bring. There's a, we, have a, we have a governing book. It's going to be on the screen. It may be on the screen already. Is it up there? Okay, good. No, I don't need it, Mark. It's okay. Because it, if anybody starts drilling down the book of discipline, I'm going to be like, no, that is Tuesday. That is not Sunday night. So, but this book of discipline is what, it's the governing document that binds us. Now, in the 1970s, essentially, the United Methodist Church created a, a thing about it, it named for the first time um, the question of homosexuality, and it said um, the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. And so self-avowed practicing homosexual persons were not allowed to be ordained. And we've been living with that way of doing church since that time. Now, the traditional non compatibilists are saying, if you change the Book of Discipline, we're out. The progressive non-compatibilists are, would be people who would say, you know what, unless every Methodist church is doing those weddings, and every pastor is, is doing same-sex marriages, and every person who wants to be ordained who passes the other qualifications, um, but who is in the LGBTQ community, unless everybody is allowed to come in and, and be ordained, we're out. Now, it's interesting because they don't really say we're out. What they say is we're never going, we're never going to go away and we're going to keep protesting in, in that. So it's, it's really a little bit different. The traditional non compatibilists they're like, we'll just leave. Now, the broad center of the United Methodist Church are people who say, some say, I'm more traditional in this. But if the church changes its stance, I'm not going anywhere. I, I can live with that. It's, I'm not, for whatever reasons, and, and there would probably be multiple reasons, that person would say, I'm not comfortable with that, but I can live with that. Progressive non-compatibilists have said, um, you know what, I think it's time for the church to make that change. And I've got reasons for that. And, and we could go into all those reasons, but it's Sunday night, and remember what I told you this morning, only an hour. And they would say, I, I'm going to stay. I know the church hasn't changed yet, but I'm going to stay, and I'm going to work and, and live in the conversation. Now, somebody sent me an email this morning, and they were curious about this, and they said, Tom, where are you in this? And um, I've moved. I've done a huge shift that is shocking to me. I have moved from a traditional non-compatibilist to a progressive compatibilist. It's a remarkable, unexpected shift in my life. And I, I feel like I've been led there by the Holy Spirit. It's been kind of a long journey for me, and I've had to do a lot of work. The time frame of that context of your shift? The time frame of... A year or two or your entire career? Um, started my career. Probably the, 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 the main part of that shift has happened in the last decade for me, as it has, quite frankly, statistically for a lot of Americans. It's, so I'm not, I'm not out of the norm when you look at the statistics on how... Um, marriage equality was passed, the legislation was passed. But I do, a, you know, I travel to Sierra Leone about every 18 months uh, when there's not a major health crisis in the country. And so I, I have some context of knowing friends and really having dear friends that are in other cultural contexts. So I feel like I understand a lot of this spectrum because I've got friends in other places, in other cultures. And I also have friends that are um, progressive non-compatibilist, you know, and, and, uh, and who find me frustrating, frankly. They find me not moving fast enough, and I, I get that too. 
So what's happened in our Methodist church is um, the progressive non-compatibilists have said, we're changing and we don't care if you change with us. We're going to start ordaining people and we're going to start doing, performing same-sex marriages. And if, they, if you do that in the Western jurisdiction, you're largely never punished. Because the bishops, see, to punish a pastor, somebody has to file charges, and then the bishop has to decide to do something with that. And in the Northeast and in the West, it's quite likely that if you're brought up on charges, there won't be any penalty. Um, in Virginia, we've only had one pastor, no, two pastors now, who have done same-sex marriages um, since the legislation was passed to make it, you know, legal civilly in the civil society. And uh, one of those... Um, is retired, so, you know, what do you do to that person, right? There's no real punitive thing. The bishop doesn't have a way to do anything if, if, if at that time it was a male, now it's a female, but he, if he wanted to. The second is a pastor out in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and she um, was, took administrative leave for a month, I think, and, and was frustrated by that, really frustrated. And she's a very, very good pastor of a very vital church, younger church. And, um, but here's what's happened. When the, when the folks, ha, you know, perform weddings, they get out of bounds of the discipline. And when they get out of the bounds of this one, the traditional non-compatibilists say, I'm really angry. Because when you do that on the left, my left, our members leave. So a, a, a wedding service is being done in California, but somebody in Alabama opens their paper, and I say Alabama because one of the pastors I spoke to about this is from <laughs> Alabama. He said they open the paper and read that United Methodists are now doing same-sex marriages, and I got people leaving my church. And I'm really angry that they're leaving the church, and I tell them, well, the Book of Discipline says you can't do it, and what they said is, but people don't pay attention to the Book of Discipline anymore. This is why the church has just become such a hard issue. And But when that happens, traditional compatibilists also leak I've lost a few people here, but we have smaller leakage because most traditional compatibilists will stay, but they also, the pastors, especially that are traditional compatibilists, are like, I'm leaking people too because of this. So when, when Karen Olivetto was, who, and she is a woman who is legally married, um, it, it, she's a lesbian person, and she said, um, she's very open, obviously, about that. She's been serving one of our most vital churches, Glad Memorial in San Francisco, that, that has a very vital ministry. So you can't say that she doesn't have gifts. You can't say she doesn't have graces. You can't, right? She's a really strong pastor, apparently. I don't know her, but reputationally. And when she became a candidate for the episcopacy back in, in the spring, a lot of us were like, ooh, this is going to get dicey. And sure enough, she, um, it did. She was elected, duly elected, consecrated, made a bishop. Well, now you can imagine that the folks on the right were really experiencing leakage in their church. But the folks on the progressive side, what they would argue, oh, what the, by the way, at general conference, every four years, see, we have these three branches. We have the council of bishops. That's the executive branch. We have the general conference. That's the legislative branch. And we have the judicial council. That's like the Supreme Court. So the legislative group gets together, and it's called General Conference, and the folks on the right said, hey, it's not about what's in the discipline, it's also about whether you keep the discipline, so let's do this, let's make a rule that will define if you do a same-sex marriage or, you know, ordain someone, this is the penalty. And let's make the penalty this, first time you get two months off, second time you're out. That'll be the penalty. And that was written up, but then it was found to be um, unconstitutional to our constitution of our church and so they couldn't they couldn't draw those hard lines but they wanted to draw that hard line because they wanted to keep everybody in the rules now the folks on the far right are really connected to the central conferences which by their very ideological nature africa and asia are much more conservative on this than most of the folks in the traditionalist camp and so that's a piece of what's happening here now, when they started to draw that hard line, and, and just living with this since the 1970s, what the progressives are saying is, is they're going, look, we're leaking too. You know, why are we still living in this church where we can't do same-sex marriages? And we've got people who are hurting. And by the way, the, the country's history with the LGBTQ community is pretty awful. And so, 
we're at a time now where we've got an opportunity and you won't let us take that opportunity and because you won't let us take the opportunity we're leaking people too and it's not just a matter of of we're losing a few members it's damaging people so a friend of mine says Tom I just want you to keep remembering people are dying young people committing suicide people losing hope I just want you to remember you know so they have that same concern and then people who are progressive compatibles are saying you know what I'm losing members too <laughs> yeah um, I've got three doll I've got four daughters who all feel the same way about this topic and they're like you know dad I just don't know about the church you know and frankly they've just got too many good friends see the difference between their generation and my generation is their friends came out in high school and everybody just had to deal with that and they just see it differently than many people in my generation and so um, all of us have had to figure this out my 80 year old father and I had a real 82 year old father and I had a really interesting conversation about this and I and he just talked about sort of where he's come and all this so that was really fascinating I won't do that to me but here's the thing that is important to remember about the United Methodist Church in America it's all leaking all the time it's all leaking all the time because in 1974 we had over three million members but Lovett Weems who's down at Wesley Theological Seminary talks about the age tsunami the death tsunami by 2015 2050 we're gonna have about 959,000 members we used to be about 8 million just think about that so individual United Methodists range across the spectrum if you're in a church like Flores we got all God's children right here probably right here but in many ways we've learned to to live at peace but it's because we haven't had to deal with the issue but what um what I would say is that for most United Methodists this is not their primary thing this is not what they go to church to to deal with but I've been telling other United Methodist clergy we have to deal with this we have to talk about it and and so what you'll find is that we've here at Flores I think we've got some progressive non compatibilist and we've got some traditional non compatibilist some of them are friends of mine and some of them have already left our church because about a year ago I said I've become more progressive on this issue and um, they feel like I am no longer a valid pastor of God's Word and it's hard but within the range of this conversation I have suffered the least of anybody there are people that are really suffering and so I would never compare myself my losses to anybody else's but I will tell you as a pastor when people look at you and they tell you um, that you're not a valid expression of a pastor preacher that's not exactly the review you were hoping to get right amen so you know you you just I, I don't I'm not by the way I'm not looking for self-care tonight please do not do that to me when you leave it's I'm all good I'm whole I'm fine but um, it's just to say it's hard to lose people and so we're sort of spread around but most of us I think are in the middle but local churches in the United States have varying centers of gravity so some local churches will be more tilted toward that traditional side and some toward the more progressive side and one could argue generally that this has some geographical connectivity think about the Northeast tends to be a little bit more progressive down south tends to be a little bit more but as I'm talking to United Methodist pastors more and more of us are saying we, we just have to do something and it's not because of the votes it's because of sort of a um, what I talked about this morning sort of a holy discontent that in, in America this is more and more becoming a missional issue our ability to reach the next generation is going to be built in part on our ability to resolve what, who we're going to be and what we're going to do so the judicial council first does this understand these frameworks does this understand I wanted to give you that to sort of help you think about the church broadly because I'm in this commission oh look at there 
Um, I'm in this commission that, um, oh, wow, once you go out, you can never go back. Okay. So um, I'm in, on this commission on the way forward, and this is the type of thing we think about a lot. But, and we've been doing a lot of study with other churches and denominations who are a little bit in front of us on this, working this out, many of whom have done very poorly and some of which have done better. And um, this Friday, um, Bishop Alavetto's ruling came from the Judicial Council, and what they said is, um, what the, West, the, the argument was from the Western jurisdiction is she has never, it's, it's self-avowed practicing, and what they said is she's never talked about that. Like you all have talked about that, but she's never talked about it. And what the Judicial Council said is um, we're going to take a legal marriage certificate as a profession, as an avowal of a lesbian relationship which she would be the first to honor. Like, she's not suggesting that she's not married to her wife. So, so what they said is that counts. And, and what happens in these cases sometimes is we start, um, rather than just dealing with it, things as they are, we start making complicated legal cases for what can't be done and what is done. But then the council did something really interesting. They said, um, by the way, we cannot remove her from office. And the reason is that's out of our purview. The Judicial Council does not extend its purview where the Book of Discipline says it doesn't have purview. So now that we have said it wasn't a legitimate consecration and the bishops who consecrated her should not have participated, she remains in good standing until charges, complaints are brought against her. And so now the Western Jurisdiction College of Bishops and its committee, jurisdictional committee on episcopacy. I serve on that committee in the southeast jurisdiction, but there's one out in the western jurisdiction. Someone will have to bring a complaint against Bishop Oliveto before she could be removed from office. Now, should such a complaint be brought, I think that, it, that she'll be removed. It'll be very interesting to see how the western jurisdiction deals with this because they have taken a very solid stand that they're not budging because they on the whole, are progressive non compatibilist So you can see how some of this sort of works its way out in like the church. So that will, I do know that complaints have been filed against her because of, you know, the obvious thing about the Book of Discipline and, and her marriage. But um, I also don't know how that will resolve itself. The Council of Bishops in the United Methodist Church is meeting tomorrow. Um, all the bishops from all over the, the world um, have flown in, and they're all meeting, and God bless them, that must be a lot of fun. I want to tell you, I, I was a candidate for the Episcopacy, and I took myself out of it, and yesterday I was like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Talk about meetings I don't want to attend. And, uh, um, but they will meet, but they are highly divided on this topic, and they're highly divided because they simply represent the communions from which they come. Um, so, I didn't really expect anything other than what happened. I'm not, somebody asked me today, are you surprised? No, I'm not surprised at all. The Judicial Council had to rule on the Book of Discipline. They can't make extra provisions up, right? And I think that their ruling is a very legitimate ruling. I mean, the, the, the book's clear. We all know it's clear. I think what really needs to be done is what, in its wisdom, the General Conference did in 2016. And there were a group of us, there were 12 of us who met before the general conference. We were invited by Bishop Brown, who's in California, and he invited us to get together. And when we sat in a conference, you know, hotel conference room, before general, two days before general conference started, he looked at 12 of us and he said, you all have got to figure out something other than what we're doing because this thing's going to blow up and it's going to hurt the church. And you have to realize in our United Methodist Church, if it breaks apart, 90, about 97% of the general conference budget comes from the United States. So if schism happens and people leave and that budget begins to break down, we've got a very large unfunded pension liability pre-1982. So our oldest clergy are on a system that's just like Social Security system, pay as you go. So if, if if a section of the church calves off and says, we're, forget you all, there are financial implications to those elderly clergy. We also have hospitals, clinics, schools, vocational centers that serve some of the most vulnerable people in the world 
in places like the Philippines and across the continent of Africa. And U.S. dollars are in partnership with African leaders to make those things happen every day of the week. So if we do a breakup, we just need to understand what we break up here over an important issue affects people there in ways that they, they have no idea what hit them. They're like, what, what do you mean? What happened? Well, that's, that's why there are many of us who are very committed to saying, we've got to figure out how to keep this thing together. Um, because the truth is, churches like Flores would be fine. We'll figure it out. But we have a connectivity that we've chosen to have, which I believe is, the best, is, is a wonderful expression of the body of Christ. But the question is, can we still have that connectivity with this? So, so far, does this make sense? Okay. So, what questions might you have about what's been happening this weekend or anything else I discussed? Yes. You know what? Uh, Nadim has a microphone. Thanks, Nadim. So, Tom, this morning you um, talked about, or you said, whenever the church gets involved in politics, it never ends well. And, <laughs> and then just a couple minutes ago, you said, and, this, and I acknowledge this is a very complex issue, and a couple minutes ago you said, so all of these clergy are representing different communities, and they have to represent their different communities, and that sort of feels like being involved in localish politics? Well, when I said that, I was speaking of bishops. And what I meant is our council of bishops gets together, but some are very progressive and some are very traditional. And the reason that that's happening is they they, they're voted on. Okay, if we voted for a bishop tonight, I think we'd probably vote for somebody in the middle. You know why? Most of us are in that middle, progressive or traditionalist. Most of us are in this middle. Quite frankly, if you were on the hard edge of either end, you probably wouldn't be going to church here because you would be angry at me already. And I tend to be a focal point. Now, to the thing about politics, um, what I was referring to was in the time of the Crusades when the church became an instrument of government or worse yet, when the church began to control the government. That was the political connection. There are always going to be polis, or the body, work of the body happening in the church. And that's different from the word politics, which has a very negative connotation. But we have to do group work together. We have to have order. We have to have structure if we're going to do mission that is broad-based, 60 different countries that we touch in the United Methodist Church through our apportionment dollars. So um, we have to be careful, though, not to take on the pattern of the world and the way we do that work. And I believe that since the 1970s, we've been taking on the pattern of the world. This is the first time. See, the way churches, the church historically tends to do its best work is in what's called a conciliar process. Do you know that word, conciliar? It means a group of people who meet in meetings and are bored for long periods of time. <laughs> <laughs> and so like the Council of Nicaea, many of us talk, you know, well, the Council of Nicaea, they came up with the Nicene Creed. Do you know how long it took them? Anybody? Three years. Three years three years to come up with a creed and at the end of it they split the church east and west over about three words and whether the spirit the holy spirit emanated from the son as well as the father so but they had to do that work but they did the work for three years so a lot of folks with this commission the way forward are like get it done you know just go in there and fix it and it's like yeah, um, how's that been working at General Conference since 1974? How's that been working? It hasn't. So it's conciliar work is an attempt to get beyond this politics, and it's also this thing where you have a chance to, you have a broad representative group so that people can go home and talk to their people, if you will, the context in which they came and say, can you live with this? Right? Can you? We're not there yet, but we're, we're getting, we will get to that space. idea about where the commission, the committee is now at some of the possible solutions? No, I'm not. I'm just not. I'm just not. You know, I will tell you, um, I met with, uh, I met by phone with David Porter, who is the chief of staff to the Archbishop of Canterbury, which, as I've been telling people, I like to say out loud because whenever I say it, I feel more important. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he, you know, they've been doing this for a long time. The Anglican Communion is international. 
Church of England. In America, you've got Episcopalians and now the new Anglican Church that's the more conservative side of the Episcopal breakoff. And it didn't go very well in America. It's been a lot of lawsuits, a lot of ugliness. And um, so he and I were just sort of talking about that on a phone call. And he said, he said, Tom, eventually you're going to get to a place that you're going to figure something out. And I'm like, okay. He said, you will either part with a blessing like Abraham and Lot, or you will walk together loosely like Paul in Romans 15, how he said, hey, some of you can eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols and you'll buy it in the marketplace and eat it because you know an idol doesn't have any power. So you don't care if it's been sacrificed to an idol, but some of you can't eat meat that's been dedicated to an idol because you feel like when you eat it, you are violating the integrity of your faith in Jesus as Lord of all. And so Paul had that problem where he had Christians here and Christians there. And, and what Paul did is he helped people to walk together loosely in that. And so he said to this group, um, even though you can do it and you're at liberty to do it, maybe you shouldn't do it. And then he said to this group, no, no, he said to you all, maybe he, because you, did, you could eat it. He said, um, you can eat it, but maybe you shouldn't if it offends the conscience of others. But then he kind of looked at this group and said, would you please lighten up <laughs> a little bit? No, that's not really in the text, but it should be. It should be. So the idea, I share that with you, not to give you some deep insight. The, the, I think that um, what has been said that's in the very dry press reports that say very little of anything other than we've all been working on relationships is I think there may be a new form of connectionalism that arises out of this. But that's, I, there is no information beyond that because we're working on that right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, given your position across the board. Hold on one second. There you go. So given your position across the categories, do you consider Flores to be an open and affirming church? Most people that want, who, who use that phrase, it would depend on what you mean by that phrase. So open and affirming church. Uh, the United Church of Christ and several other progressive churches use that term to, to say um, anyone across the spectrum, regardless of their beliefs on sexuality, are welcome and um, included in the church. So it is better for people in our church who are in the LGBT community to interpret that than me. Because you see, if I say, yes, we are, that's my view. And I'm certain that my view feels a lot easier to come to than other people's. I have had gay people in the church and a transgendered person, in our, two transgender people in the church, say, because we're not just here, we're in Reston, say they have found it to be an open and affirming place. However, if you come to me and say, would you do my marriage if, if you were gay, I would say no. I'm not allowed to as United Methodist pastor. Um, and and I, I'm going to... I am not going to challenge that. I'm going to wait for the commission to do its work. That level of patience is very frustrating to some. But I believe that church work should be done properly in an order. And I actually think we're closer to a shift than we've ever been. I, I actually have hope for this process that we can get to a place where people can essentially get what they want and need. I don't think we're all going to end up doing the same thing. But I'm, I'm actually starting to feel hopeful, and I, there's part of me that doesn't want to because I've been to a general conference four times, and it feels pretty hopeless. And um, I've watched things go down in flames time and time again, but I feel like the Holy Spirit's putting hope in me about this. I think that's one of the reasons I had so much passion this morning and this evening is that text, you know, that hope does not disappoint. So that's a very limited sample size in answer to your question. Um, I don't think we have a broad um, group of people. You know, I was talking to Stan Copeland, who's the pastor at Lover's Lane down in Dallas, Texas, and that's a more traditional church in a more traditional area. And Stan, now that's a bigger church, probably four or five times bigger than this one. And Stan said, we now have probably two to 300 um, people, LGBTQ persons who are attending our church. And I said, Stan, how'd that start? He said, start with a Bible study. He said, it started with a group of people who just came and said, can we do Bible study in, in Lover's Lane? And, and, I, and he said, if you're studying the Word of God, I'd love to have you. Come on in. And he said, he said, by the way, why don't you all go down to 
the uh, metropolitan church that's in that region. And they said, we actually want to go to a church where everybody is here. And so, and we were, they were in a Baptist church and that didn't go well. So they came to him and he said, because the Bible study and because the, the church is so focused on love, it's Lover's Lane United Methodist, which is their geographical space, but they've really made love a big aspect of their mission statement, creating a community of love. And he said, our church is changing, you know? So it's been really hard in this church just to make, get our church to be multicultural. When I came here, everybody was white. Everybody, except like three people. And uh, we had a family, and they said, um, we're leaving. And I said, no, Christy, don't leave. And she said, Tom, I want my children to grow up with everybody and not just white people. And we're African American, and you know, it's important to us. And I said, Christy, if you leave, we're never going to get there. And I need you to I said, maybe this white church is your mission outpost to bring you. And she stayed, and because she, that family stayed, more families came. Now, if you look around right now, most of us are white, right? Part of that's because South Asian families find this topic pretty uncomfortable. So when you say, are we an open and affirming church? What I'm saying is, I think so. I think love is the, what the average person in this church wants. I really believe that. But if you're asking me, can, I ha can somebody have a, a same-sex marriage? Not at this time. If you're asking, is everybody going to have the same experience of that? Because we've been focusing on being a multicultural church, it's actually getting harder. <laughs> I was like, the other day, I was just like, oh, man, it's, it's really going to be a, a trick to get all this together. And I think the only thing that is going to get it together is love and the love of Christ. So what I would tell you is, as the lead pastor of Florida Shane Methodist Church, that's kind of why I'm still here. I'm trying to see if the crazy experiment called church can actually work. And I think all is all. Tom, you mentioned that a number of people have left the church, both um, on the progressive side and the traditionalist side. Have there been any studies done about what churches they go to or if they return to church after leaving it? And oh, yeah. If so, what are those findings? Um, Paul, I don't know if there's been a formal study, but I can tell you sort of what I know. Um, and I can't, but I can't quote a study. There may be a study out there. Love at Weems would probably know that. Um, more traditional people tend to go to Bible churches and independent churches. So McLean Bible does very well in our area because they pick up a lot of formerly mainline people who feel like the mainline church has lost its way. Now, to their credit, a lot of mainline churches, people are leaving because they're just so darn bored because the preaching is terrible and the programming's awful. And I, I mean, I just have to say that. There's a lot of boredom that's killing the church. It has nothing to do with these issues. But to those for, and listen, Paul, when I say we've lost people, we, it's not hordes of people, it's, it's some people. They just happen to be dear to me, which is what frustrates me. Frankly, if I wouldn't have liked them, I probably would have felt better about it, but <laughs> many of them I actually liked, and so I'm joking, but I'm not. Okay, the point is, the progressive folks tend to go to the United Church of Christ, which you just said, UCC, um, Disciples of Christ. And these are churches, um, there's also a sector of United Methodist churches that are in the Reconciling Ministry Network. So their former executive director is on our commission. Matt's on our commission, lovely, wonderful guy. And um, so there are United Methodist churches that people will go to because they know they are ready to make that jump. But in Virginia, you can't really find anybody who's doing the weddings, um, a wedding. And so... Um, UCC is more progressive. Disciples of Christ are more progressive. Um, American Baptists tend to be more progressive, but we don't have that many in this area. And then there are other, you know, independent churches that are known to be progressive. But the more traditional tend to go Southern Baptist or tend to go independent. Most of the independent churches in your community are ideologically conservative. That just goes with the territory. I don't know. Yeah, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to. Yeah, over here. Hey, Tom. Um, Tim, I've only been coming here since uh, last summer, and uh, my experience here at Florist has been wonderful. 
Um, as a gay man who's uh, coming up on 60 years old, uh, I've been out of the closet for a long time, Car uh, Karen Oliveto was actually the dean uh, at the seminary in Berkeley where I went to school. And wow. she was the pastor at Glide where I worked for 10 years. Um, but one of the things that I learned in seminary was that social context is everything. Mm -hmm. Social context about my being white, my being affluent, my being having been raised Midwestern, Irish Catholic, you know, all those things are part of my social context. And in the conversation about social context and in the world United Methodist Church conversation, how do, how do we bring in covenant, the, the concept of covenant where I agree to covenant with you regardless of whether or not we disagree. I think I heard you preach on this recently, Tom. And the thing about it is, is whether we're talking politics or whether we're talking LGBT rights or immigrant rights, whatever it is, whatever conversation we're in, how does covenant play into my respect for your social context, your respect for mine, and our commitment to journey together in conversation that allows us to deal with the really hard stuff in a way that you know, allows us all to experience kind of the glory uh, here and now. Yeah, that's a... I'm betting you've got a much better answer in your head already than I do. Um, but I would say, um, I think we see the world different, uh, similarly. I sort of say differently, but similarly. Um, I was really fortunate that I was raised by a married couple who loved each other deeply and argued on occasion. And sometimes when they argued, they really argued. Like it was, like, honestly, you as a kid, you're like, is the world coming undone, you know? And, and um, I sort of, you know, I've, I've known people who said they've never had an argument and they've never, but I was, I was sort of happy that my parents had arguments. Because what it taught me is, is that we were all going to be together after the argument. And that's because it was a covenanted relationship. And they were um, connected in love in that way. Um, Tim Keller says that marriage is the place where you will be most sanctified. If you choose to be married, that's where you're going to experience the most of your sanctification. And the reason is the person you're married to knows you the best, and if you can listen to them and hear them and be humble enough to accept what they're saying, God will help you become more than you are right now. But by its very nature, it's going to have tension and friction and rub. But what keeps it together is the covenant. Now, in some marriages, a spouse tries to say, hey, this is probably not great, and this is not great, and this is not great, but the other person doesn't have enough humility to ever hear them and never wants to really change, and so then the covenant has difficulty, right? Now, I think the church is a form of covenant. We use covenantal language when people join. Do you hear the questions I ask people when they join? I'm always stunned. Honestly, when people join the church, they're like, I will, I do, I do. I'm like, do you know what I'm asking you? I'm asking you if you will resist the spiritual forces of evil. Like, it's, it's almost like we're asking you to become a comic book character, you know? I mean, seriously, like, they are, it's powerful language, but it's powerful language because it's covenantal language. And I think sometimes when people leave the church, and I can only speak about when they leave the church because of me, and if you're a pastor for any length of time, it happens a lot, and uh, it's, it's a sadness that I carry. Because in every church, I know people that left because of me. And, and, you know, Paul, most of them, I think, went to other churches, but some of them didn't. And I think the reason I get so deeply disappointed is I think this is a covenantal space. Which is why I think I'm not a bad person to have in the room on this commission the way forward. Because, like, I'm just going to hunt you down. You know? I'm serious. Like, I'm going to make you have dinner with me. And I'm sitting, I'm one of these people that's like, by the end of this meal, you will like me. You don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> one of us doesn't know that you're going to like me, and it's not me, because I know. And so I'm, I'm a big believer that, that part of what's really been the friction that's helped me be sanctified is the things that other people taught me in the church that made me deeply uncomfortable. So a little story about that. You know, our... our members who are from Africa quite often, but it's more the South Asian members. When somebody from India or Pakistan comes up to you out these doors 
And like, you're just like shaking hands, shaking hands, shaking hands. And, and you know, the Americans, they're all like, see you later, see you later, like, nice sermon, nice sermon. I always tell pastors, when people say nice sermon, they don't mean nice sermon. They mean see you later, see you later. But, but we're standing up here. The Indian family will come up to me with their two kids and, and stand there with people behind them. And they will say, our son has got this problem at school. Would you pray for him? Now, if you're an American brain, what they're saying is, hey, when you get a minute sometime, would you remember to pray for me? And I'll see you later. They're registering something's happening. But if you're an Indian family and you say, will you pray for me? It took me like two or three times, but I finally figured out, oh, you mean pray for you right now. And so what you do is you say, hey, let's just take hands and pray for one another. First time I did that, it was really awkward for me. And I'm a pastor. This is so embarrassing. I'm a pastor. But I'm standing there. There's a crowd. My socialization is time intensity, right? So I was socialized, shake hands, shake hands, shake hands. Let people move on. They're getting to the next thing. Don't hold them up. Don't hold them up. But the, in, the family from India is saying, would you pray for our son? So I'm feeling very awkward standing right there in the church. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to pray for you. I pray. And then they look at me and they're done. They're like, thank you. Thank you. And they move on. So today I had this experience. So we're talking about sanctification, right? Today I had this experience, and there's this guy who's a fraternity brother of mine from Virginia Tech. And trust me, that was not the most holy space I've ever been in in my life. So that's, that's my context with him. And then his wife, who has pretty serious back issues, and she's going to have to have surgery. Last week she thought the surgery was going to be here, but now she's discovered she has to have a surgery on her neck first because it's going to do nerve damage. And so she looks at me and she says, would you pray for me? And what she means is, this week sometime, would you pray for me? She even said that. She was, you know, sometime this week if you get a chance. She said it just like that. And I looked at her and I said, no, let me show you how we do this. And I said, just step into the sanctuary, just one step. And I, and I took their hands. And I, and I took my fraternity brother's hand. And you could tell he's like, what is going on, you know? <laughs> and so I said, you know what the, our Indian families have taught me is that you ought to pray right now, right here. You shouldn't put it off because you might forget. And I'm not that good of a person especially on Sunday mornings. I just forget everything. So I held their hands and we prayed. Now, why am I telling you this very long story? I'm telling you this long story because that's why I like being in church with people who don't think like me and from the same social context as me. Because God's perfecting me. Now, the difficulty with same-sex attraction is that the more traditional you are, the more you will see that not as a social context, but as a sin righteousness context and the more you're on the progressive end of the spectrum the more you'll see same-sex attraction as a I'm made in God's image and justice issue so when you get made in God's image justice in a room with violates the dictates of scripture you have officially a very interesting conversation that may or may not go well but what if we could create a church where love was so strong at the center that we could actually have the conversation? Because you know how people change? Really? It's not because they memorize the scripture. People change when they come to know other people as brothers and sisters in Christ. And it changes everything. And so you ask, like, how long has that taken? Ten years? Um, probably 20 Actually, probably 30, because the, the, first, the first openly gay person who I knew was in seminary. And he came out during seminary, and I was so dumb. I mean, I was, just forgive me what I'm about to say, because it is my socialization. I grew up in the Shindo Valley. But he said, Tom, I came out this summer, and I'm gay. And I said, no, you're not. You can't be. I met your date you know, at that thing we all went to. And he's like, yeah, that was not real, though. That was the thing you didn't know. And, and I was like, are you really? And, he, and his fear 30 years ago, because that was when HIV AIDS was first coming out, and his pastors, I was the first generation of clergy who walked into rooms with people who had HIV AIDS and prayed with people. And, no, I mean, honestly, HIV AIDS was of a concern here at that time the way Ebola was in Africa in Sierra Leone two years ago. And I remember the conversations we had and we were told stand at the room and just 
shout the prayer inside. And we were like, I don't think so. I don't think that's a good practice. I'm not sure, you know, I'm new here, but. Um, and so he said, I think people like me in 20 years will be rounded up and put in camps. That, that's what his dismal view was of the world. But so over this time period, but in the last 10 years especially, what's really shifted is I've just gotten to know people. And when you get to know people, God will use that in a variety of ways. And the people who feel the, the strongest about this tend to be the people who know the least amount of people. And so I think that this community thing is in, in the covenant. That's why your covenant observation is so good. And I'll tell you something else. I have no idea how many gay people are in the church because I don't know who they are. Like, I didn't know that about you. So um, isn't that nice, right? But now that I know about you, it'll just be something I know about you. It won't be your identity, if that makes sense. It'll be a part of, of who you are. I hope that's the right thing. I hope that's a good thing. Yes. We make an interesting observation I learned a long time ago. It's, it's fine to have an opinion about uh, something, whatever it is, until you know that person or love that person. It can shift your opinion dramatically. You know, Rob Portman, very conservative senator, dead set against gays. His son's gay. Changes his opinion. Yeah. So it's fine to have an opinion until you know somebody about it or love somebody. Yeah, I think it's, you know, who taught me that, Dave? Part of who taught me that, some of our, you and I have a common friend who's one of the older members of the church, and she helped te teach me that. And uh, I was so impressed when older people, you know, they've got all that wisdom, but when you discover they're not like progressive for the sake of being progressive, they're progressive because they love people, you know? And so they, they want progress, but that same woman holds very traditional values. She has very traditional values. So she, you know, we've got some people that are the both and, and they've helped us. Anybody else have a question? Robin? Hey, do you all know Robin Sparks? She's our lay leader. You might want to know that. Lay leader is an office yeah. in the church. Thanks for that. Yeah. And thanks for this. So speaking of age spectrum, now the other end, younger, both those who come to church and those who might be clergy one day. We need both for the future of the church as well as all of us. I'm just wondering what comments you might share, what you've heard or learned about where they fall in the spectrum. What impact at all is this issue in particular having, not just on young people still coming to church, but on young people deciding to be clergy? Yeah, I think um, we always have to remember to be careful of generalizations. Um, my, my daughters are progressive on this issue, um, but I've got members of my family who are young, some of their cousins who are very traditional in this issue. So I think we, you know, I think, Paul, that's where the statistics help us, and I don't, I don't have memory of the, there are studies about that. I can tell you this, young clergy in the Virginia Annual Conference are predominantly progressive. So young would be defined as under 40, not under 30, under 40, <laughs> those, which tells you a little something about the United Methodist Church, but those clergy are unequivocally more progressive than their peers that are older. And they are just so tired of this even being an issue. They're done, you know. But they're not leaving. They're compatibilists. But they are praying for hope that something will change. And I, I, I certainly would never say all of them, but to my experience, the majority of them. And um, there's, I'm going to go down to Nashville on Thursday and meet with a group of people who are centrist. We're, you know the problem with being in the middle is you don't have any definition, you don't have a name, you don't have a magazine, you don't like the, 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 the Good News Movement, which is a traditional movement in our church, and they do a lot of great stuff, but they've got a magazine and it's really cool, you know, and it's glossy and all that. But um, the centrist, we've never had that. And what we're realizing is we need to start defining ourselves and not, don't think center like wishy-washy on everything think center like center of gravity. We center on grace. We center on God's love. We, we also center on the scripture. So what are the things that center you? That's what we're trying to think about. 
but that group has had invitations to a lot of um, younger um, clergy because we, we think there's a large coalition there. Now, doesn't that sound political? There are some politics to this. There really are. And we, we ought to be, as, um, what did Jesus say? Be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. So it's trying to keep, a book that we read on this commission is called The Anatomy of Peace. The Anatomy of Peace. That is a very fine book. There's a second book called Leadership and Self-Deception. The Anatomy of Peace was so helpful to me on a personal level. I, um, I've got this little notebook. I, I drew all the, all the diagrams of it. I review them routinely because I, it talks about having a heart at peace or a heart at war. And when you have a heart at war about an issue with somebody, you put them in a box and you define them. And the key to having real civil conversation is to release people from the predetermined box you put them in and allow them to be who God has already made them to be. And I've been learning more how to do that over these past months. And it's been just really a, a great blessing, but terribly hard. So not over this issue, but over the personal part of that's harder than the commission part. So anybody else? Yes. Um, your commission is, is it originally going to? Your commission was originally going to have a recommendation by 2018. Right. Is there, you're still on track for that? Is we there, are on track for is that. Is there going to be a decision made, or is the results of your work going to be done at the next general conference? Um, there is now a called general conference in February of 2019, only for the work of the commission. It will not deal with any other issues. It won't deal with the budget. It won't deal with other legislative matters, only for the work of the commission. And that, to me, is the smartest thing they could have done. And it's going to be expensive, but you know what? This is already expensive. This is already a big mess. So we might as well fix it in some form or fashion. So um, the commission is on track on its deadlines, and some of us are working weekly right now. I'm in meetings weekly right now. The in video conference is a beautiful thing. You can be different parts of the world and still. And it's ordination and marriage are the two focal points of the commission? The two focal points are ordination and marriage, so we could include consecration in with ordination, even though it's a separate thing. Right. But the commission's scope, there's a document on the Commission on the Way Forward called Mission, scope, Mission Vision Scope that the Council of Bishops created because they created this commission. And part of it will allow, what it allows is to say, to think of the structure of the United Methodist Church in the future that would allow us to have a way forward. So that gets you into a whole different space about, okay, how would you be structured to make this happen? Because here's what we gave up on. We gave up that this person was going to convince this person to change their mind. And we did that in the first two minutes. That became a rule. The rule was there is no magic speech. See, at General Conference, we've all been waiting for the magic speech, and it's magic thinking. And the magic speech is the one that once somebody gave it, everybody would go, oh, that's it, right? Well, there isn't a magic speech on this. There's a lot of life that you have to deal with. And so we gave up on that. So then the question becomes, do we want to stay as a connectional church? Is that what we want? And if we don't want that, because you all may not know this, we don't own this building. Did you know that? Florida County Methodist Church does not own this building. It is held by our trustees in trust for the United Methodist Church. So if we want to do something different, we all have to go leave. And even though people like me and you have put a lot of money into this thing, we don't own it. That's because we came from the Anglican Church in the 1700s and they had a trust clause where the congregation held it in trust for the denomination. And John Wesley, being a good Anglican priest, wrote that into everything he purchased. And that's true in Africa, and that's true in America, it's true everywhere you go. So that creates a power of coercion. So you may be wondering, why isn't the United Methodist Church like splintered over this? Why isn't it fractured over this? And the reason is, it would be like the, what the Episcopalians did a few years back when they paid millions and millions of dollars to attorneys and then lost their property because the trust clause held. And frankly, Jesus has something. He said, he said, listen, if you're going to go to court, settle it along the way because it's a very bad witness when Christians go to court to do this. So we're really trying to honor that scripture, but there's this coercive thing that keeps us together. I, I would like to say it in a different word, but there just isn't one. Yeah, it is. And I'm okay with it. 
I knew about it. You know, I'm okay with it. We all knew about it. Anything else? Two minutes. Thank you, Nadim. Nadim's taking care of me. That's a wonderful thing. Okay. Um, thank you all. What a nice time. This is a nice conversation. I mean, I hope this, you've experienced it that way. I have, let me express. I have experienced this. this is, a, is a nice experience of conversation. Um, that's one of the reasons I didn't want to leave. It's really a hard decision. But... Um, and maybe it was a cowardly thing, you know? This is, just feels a little bit more comfortable, but I just thought, one of the things I thought about during that decision was, could we actually do it? Could we actually create, with all these types of things, could we actually create a community of love that could hold together in this stormy time? And uh, so this is sort of the, the great experiment I'm a part of, and, uh, and I hope you will continue to be as well.